Hey, Saturday listeners. Today we are revisiting an interview episode. Fashion historian April Callahan appeared on our show as a guest. Now, April and fellow fashion historian Cassidy Zachary have a podcast of their own that is part of the How Stuff Works family, which is called Dressed. So listen to April's interview and then check out Dressed, the history of fashion at dressedpodcast.com. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy B. Wilson. And uh, Tracy, as you and our listeners will recall, back in January, we had fashion historian and author April Callahan of the Fashion Institute of Technology on to talk about the stenciling technique of pochoir and her amazing book on fashion plates that covers 150 years of style as it developed. And not long after that interview, uh, as April and I were emailing back and forth, she mentioned a lecture that she gave a few years ago about World War II fashion in France. And I was immediately intrigued. And so uh, she had sent me some of the info about it, and I asked her to please, please, please come back and talk about that. So that is what we were talking about today. Yeah, I remember when that conversation happened, and you were immediately so excited. (laughs) It's like, Tracy, Tracy, she has this cool thing. I want to talk about it. Um, Yeah. Well, in addition to it being something that is is, uh, one of your personal interests, The subject itself is incredibly interesting and not something I ever had thought of of before, right? We've talked on the show when fashion has been dictated by world events uh, because of things like there was a shortage of fabric, so everybody wore things that required less fabric. But this is a whole other, way more involved uh, timeline and and factors that, that we're looking at today. Yeah, it's one of those things that if you are maybe a listener who is not into fashion stuff, I encourage you to give it a listen because it might surprise you. We are going to talk about fashion, but it's really about how fashion became a tool for the people of France. Yeah. So what Holly and April talked about in this interview is how fashion reacts to times of conflict and how fashion became a form of political resistance in France specifically. So if you uh, think of fashion as something frivolous that people shouldn't really spend their time talking about these insights that April shares about the place of style and the greater marketplace and economy of a culture might really change your mind on that. Yeah, so let's hop right in. All righty, so today, listeners, we once again have one of my favorite guests ever, April Callahan, back to talk about some fashion history. Welcome back to the podcast, April. Oh, thank you. I think I'm blushing right now. Ah. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm always delighted to talk to you because you always have cool information. And today we are going to talk about uh, fashion as a form of rebellion, but not necessarily in the sense that people might think of in terms of young people bending rules, but an actual historical moment in time, which is France during the German occupation in World War II. Uh, And April did a lecture on this particular topic at Yale some years back, and she was kind enough to share the notes on it with me. So uh, it seemed like just way too rich and cool a topic to let go by without doing a show on it. So first, I have to ask you, what inspired you to research French fashion during the German occupation? Yeah, sure. So um, I think I mentioned this last time I was on the show, but um, the intersection of war and fashion has always been kind of one of my special interests as a fashion historian. Um, How does fashion react in times of crisis? To me, this is a really fascinating question. And a lot of really creative, interesting things happen to fashionable clothing and dress during these periods of extreme conflict when people are forced to balance the basic system subsistence that's required for their daily lives with this innate human desire to outwardly define ourselves to others. As human beings, clothing is, of course, one of the main ways that we practice defining ourselves to others. Um, so a few years ago, I, when I was invited to speak at that um, symposium that you referenced at Yale, um, it was actually on street style. So I decided I didn't really want to speak about contemporary street style because I figured my fellow presenters were going to cover this with great prowess. Um, I wanted to do something a little bit different, so I started digging back a bit, 
and I became entirely smitten with how these French women were using fashion during the Nazi occupation as this really active form of political resistance. And ever since then, um, this is something I've been into, and I actively collect both French and German fashion magazines from the time period, um, basically 1939 to 1945. And to some, it may seem a little bit odd for the idea of clothing and specifically style to be a really vital aspect of a country's wartime experience. But this really, really was a massive concern in France when the German occupation began. Can you talk about why that was the case? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that thinking about fashion and war together can seem absolutely antithetical at first. And I'm going to speak fairly generally here when I say that many people view fashion as a sort of frivolous, unnecessary luxury, and they don't give any due weight to its role in our economy. But fashion is truly a cog in this wheel of capitalism. For capitalism to work, the desire to consume has to be sparked. And the fashion system is a catalyst for igniting consumers' desires to replace still useful objects with new ones that are perceived to be more in line with the current mode. And this is a huge part of what drives the marketplace. Um, but in terms of France, the Sun King himself, Louis XIV, recognized the significance of fashion way, way back in the 17th century. And I'm talking the 1600s here. And he started actively and aggressively cultivating France's luxury industries as a way to strengthen his nation's economy. And then what happened was over the ensuing century, France really established itself as this arbiter of style for the whole rest of the world. So by the time World War II happened, by the 1940s, there was an international cachet associated with all things French, and especially French clothing. Fashion was therefore both a matter of economic stability for the country, but also a matter of national pride. So it's not really that surprising that it was a hot topic when the Germans seized control of a large portion of France um, and also its resources in 1940. And I mentioned resources. Um, These resources were super important to the Germans. To keep their war machine functioning, it required all sorts of basic things like food, metal, fuel. Um, It required wool and leather for clothing and silk for parachutes. So um, under the terms of the armistice, the Germans retained the right to make demands of France's raw materials. And, and this pertains, this is what happens. A system of rationing starts to be implemented. Fuel was the first thing to go scarce. Um, three months into the occupation, food started being rationed. Um, foodstuffs like meat, bread, milk, butter, and eggs, really basic things, sugar also, um, those became subject to rationing. But more important to what we're talking about now, um, later that year, the Nazis instituted restrictions governing the manufacture and sale of clothing. And you mentioned in your uh, in your paper that they set up this point system for allocating wardrobe vouchers. And I'm really curious how exactly that worked and, moreover, how it was received by the French. And then uh, you also talk a little bit about a trend called System D, and I want you to talk about how that arose from this whole voucher situation. Yeah, sure. Um, so how the voucher system works was or worked um, was each French citizen who held a food ration card because the food ration system was implemented first. Um, they were also issued coupons, which totaled 30 points, and this was for their annual clothing consumption. So were you to go into a store or a boutique to buy something, you would have to present your coupon and also pay for the pay for the pay for the garment or accessory. Um, And this allotment, this number, um, how they assign the points, the value systems to things, this is really at barely at subsistence level. Um, So if you in a single year purchased one wool skirt, one short sleeve blouse, and a pair of cotton stockings, this was essentially all you could buy for the year. That was it. Um, So you can imagine how this was really demoralizing to the French. You know, fashion had been part of their national identity for centuries. This is is something that they're very proud about and and for. Um, So 
what emerged in the wake of this clothing restriction system is really super inspiring, to me at least. Um, A lot of French women decided that they were not going to take this lying down. It was really important to them that they uh, retain their reputation for chic. And they started coming up with all sorts of creative workarounds to these clothing restrictions. The first tactic they employed became known as système D in French pronunciation, or système D. You know, it wasn't choice A, B, or C. It was choice D. It was like your fourth option. You know, the one that you had very little (laughs) choice but to accept. (laughs) Um, And what it was was a more extreme form of the um, American campaign that got dubbed Make Do and Mend from the same time period. And both of these um, campaigns encouraged the recycling, the reuse, and repurposing of garments. So, for instance, um, they would take old sweaters and unravel them for the yarn and then re-knit them into new garments. Or a man's old suit might be ripped open at the seams to be used for the textiles and recut into a boy's suit or maybe a woman's jacket. Um, women would take lace or trimmings off old garments that couldn't be repaired and then transfer them on to new garments. But um, one of the funny and most interesting examples of System Day that I've seen was uh, detailed in a French fashion magazine, uh, which provided the really detailed instructions, like practically step-by-step, of how to take dog hair groomed from long-haired breeds like poodles and how to spin and cart it and turn it into knitting yarn. That's fantastic. It is. Uh, (laughs) And I imagine if you had rabbits, you would be set with Angora. And I'm also wondering, one, I have to say, I love System Day in terms of just the DIY angle to it is so, as you said, it's very inspiring and it's sort of charming, even though it's really a very, uh, I'm going to use the overword term of fierce, but it it really is. It's such a dig in, like just digging in your heels and going, nope, you cannot dictate what we wear. We're going to find our own way. I love it, love it, love it. Absolutely. There was like, these fashions were defiant, basically. So let's now pick up my interview with April Callahan to hear about how shoes in particular during this time actually have echoes in contemporary fashion. I know you talk a little bit about this in uh, the research that you did, but will you talk some about how rationing changed footwear in France? Because I think that is fascinating. Yeah, yeah, um, and and has an interesting twist and in, in connection to contemporary fashion, um, which I'll speak about here in a second. But um, shoes were a huge problem in occupied France. Um, in 1941 alone, the Nazis took for themselves five million pairs of the country's overall production of eight million, so more than half. Um, at the same time, under under the governance and rules that they instituted, the French were only allowed to resole their shoes once a year. And they were allowed to buy no more than one new pair of shoes made from rationed materials every four years. So this is a huge problem. Um, Leather was one of the main rationed materials and seriously in short supply. So cobblers started resoling their clients' shoes with whatever materials they could get their hands on. And some of these (laughs) were were very bizarre, um, including old tires. They would waterproof cardboard and use that and either um, braid or plate strips of straw and use that to resole their clients' shoes. Um, But manufacturers at the time also recognized this problem. So they started turning to these alternate materials that were unregulated by German mandates. And... um, It's through this necessity that one of the most iconic looks of the 1940s was born. Um, Shoemakers started using wood, cork, and plastic, all of which were unrationed materials. And they started using them to create heavy platform and wedge shoes. And the thickness of these ensured the longevity of your purchase, right? Because the height would take longer to wear down. Mm -hmm. 
So um, any of you out there who are fans of wood or cork wedge shoes that are like super fashionable today, you can you can th- you can thank French ingenuity of this period next time you you strap them on. That is so funny to me because we think of that as such like particularly in resort wear cork is so, cork shoes are so popular and it's all because of a time when the idea of having resort time was really not in the picture at all. Uh, so I love it. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about was the rather brazen move or plan on the part of Germany that ended up thankfully getting derailed, which was that uh, apparently there was a plan to move the couture industry out of Paris, which is terrifying. Uh, and how exactly did that get derailed? Like, how was that stopped? So, indeed, yes. Um, plans for the the moving of the Paris couture industry to Germany were well underway. Um, the Germans recognized the fiscal significance of not only French haute couture, but also their own domestic fashion industries. Um, it's really curious and a point that kind of underscores the hypocrisy of the Nazi party. On one hand, um, they were on the domestic home front, they were officially promoting this archetype of the wholesome German housefrau and mother wearing traditional dress. But on the other hand, in practice, they were actively supporting German high fashion exports for monetary gain. Um, and, I, and I feel like it's an important point here to make that the general German populace were also subject um, to clothing rationing starting in 1939. But by that point, within Germany, it was almost a moot point because so much of the country's own resources had already been drained. Um, for years prior to 1939, the German people had kind of been railroaded into giving and donating whatever they could spare to the war effort. You know, there, there, there are instances of young brides that, um, donating their wedding gowns to the cause because they thought that the silk might be able to be used for parachutes. Um, but yes, um, during the occupation, the Germans raided the offices of the governing body of Paris haute couture industry, and they summoned a president at the time who was a couturier, Lucien Lelong. And it was a little bit of a complicated process with the Germans, back and forth, back and forth. But Lalong was eventually able to convince them that haute couture was too inextricably tied to Paris, that to force it for a wholesale deportment of the industry to Germany, that that would kill its spirit. And and also that it was really kind of an unfeasible proposition to export all of these tangential industries that supplied the couture. You know, you had the textile manufacturers, you had ribbon and flower makers, you have dyers, you have pleaters, bead makers, embroiderers, milliners, you know, to, to move all of those people, all those people and industries was going to be a Herculean effort, essentially. And your uh, lecture was titled Sleeping Cobras. Will you explain to us what a sleeping cobra was in the context of fashion in France in the 1940s? And how was that style emblematic of France really kind of hanging on to its national identity during this time of occupation? Sure. Um, so I think the term sleeping cobra can be can apply in a couple different ways. Um, I was kind of using it in two different ways in my reference there. Um, first, it could be um, as a metaphor for these women, right, who were kind of silently protesting um, with the fashions that they were wearing. But the phrase itself um, is something um, that's loosely based um, on uh, the writings of one of the lead, leading couturiers of the period, Elsa Scaparelli. In one of her autobiographies, she wrote about the hats that French women were wearing during and just after the occupation. And a lot of people were legitimately shocked when the first images of Paris appeared after the liberation because the fashion seemed so strange, Mm -hmm. so bizarre. The silhouette had really become extreme and exaggerated. It had these really wide, heavily padded shoulders, these tall, clunky shoes, and the hemlines had risen. They'd become much shorter. Um, but the hats, the hats, they were truly bizarre. Um, Scaparelli called them an incredible horror, and she compared <laughs> yeah, she compared the giant turbans that these women were wearing, she compared them to monstrous cobras that had eaten a huge meal and crawled up to sleep. Um, and, and Cecil Beaton, who was like great, um, you know, cultural touchstone of the time and bon vivant, um, he said they uh, looked suspiciously like domestic plumbing. 
Um, <laughs> I know. I love it. But uh, the hats were really kind of one of the main ways that French women were using fashion as a form of political resistance during this period. And one of the reasons for that is the materials, um, many of the materials used to make hats that were used in millinery were unrestricted. So this became the sort of unexpected medium through which women were able to wage a silent protest. And um, wh- how this kind of happened was is that in the 1930s, hats were a little more trim, a little more tidy, um, but in the 1940s, they morphed into these really sort of outlandish, oversized creations. And turbans grew so large that some of them actually required interior wooden architectures that then would be wrapped and swathed with like yards and yards of fabrics. So the shapes, the sizes, and the trimmings of these hats were exaggerated to the point of being ridiculous. And this was intentional. Um, women were basically flaunting extravagance in the face of the enemy. They had no choice, right, but to wear these threadbare dresses or things that were kind of like mended and patched. You know, they were making do. They were wearing shoes, which may or may not barely be holding together. So it was through these hats. Um, this was their way to express themselves. And, and sometimes these hats functioned explicitly as objects of revolt. Um, one of my very favorite hats of the time period, which is in a collection in France, um, it, would, it featured a really wide, upturned brim. And the brim had been printed with hash marks that resemble um, the hash marks of a radio dial. And above that, it was printed post Parisien. And post Parisien had been a really popular radio station before the occupation. And when the Nazis seized control of the media, it silenced post Parisien and replaced it with a different station, a, a pro German, you know, collaborative station. Um, so some of these hats that they were wearing were actually quite pointed in the political statements that they were making. And speaking additionally of women who were really driving some of this protest, uh, will you talk a little bit about the Midinettes and how they were really kind of the arbiters of style in some ways? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, Midinettes were women who worked in the fashion industry. Um, Oftentimes they were young women, and they were really kind of the hands or the worker bees of the fashion industry. So they had all these technical skills, right? So they took System D or System D to a whole new level of sophistication. Um, they would sew old scarves together to create these wild patchwork textiles from which they would create garments. Um, and they had all sorts of fun with ribbons because ribbons were unrationed. So they would sew them together to make these really wide, whimsical skirts. Um, but once again it was with the hats that they were really sticking it to the Germans. Um, They made enormous hats from loops and loops of ribbons and scraps of cardboard and oil cloth. And sometimes they would build like fully fashioned little vignettes and scenes into the hats. You know, it might be like a reproduction of a French village or a really important French chateau. Um, But there was an article in Vogue about the Midonettes right after the liberation of Paris in 1944, um, talking about them and how many of their creations were intentionally made to annoy the Germans. And, and this was the point that wasn't entirely lost on Nazi officials. Um, they actually complained to Lucien Lalonde, head of the Chambre Syndicale, about it. And his response, which I think he was probably loving every minute of what the <laughs> Midnets were doing, <laughs> but his official response was, I can't do anything about this. These styles are not being issued by fashion houses. And I think this really underscores how a lot of these styles of the period um, this were, were what you were saying, DIY fashion. These were street styles created by the people. I love the idea that just by virtue of walking down the street in the garments that you have made and chosen to wear, you are making a huge political statement. Uh, and in talking about some of these sort of coded rebellious messages, there is uh, some stuff in your lecture notes about coded messages on belts. You have to talk about these. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, because these are kind of great. Um, So women were painting or embroidering belts. This is nothing new. Um, But they started doing it during the occupation with motifs that 
frequently held hidden meanings. Um, you might see a very pretty belt um, decorated with little de delicate arabesques, um, but they're actually Vs to symbolize victory. Um, some of the belts you see have musical notes on them, which seem pretty harmless and charming, but if you could read music, you would know that their score was actually taken from patriotic French songs. And one of my favorites of the period was a belt that was um, entitled Long Ago, and it was hand-painted, um, and it was hand-painted with little images of favorite French dishes, which had disappeared given all the food shortages. That's so cool. Um I mean, it's one of those things that I suspect many people at the time, like most German officers were not thinking, oh, I bet there are coded messages in those ridiculous belts. <laughs> so it's such a wonderful sort of sneaky way to still like assert your uh, your feelings on the matter of occupation. Yeah, so in some alternate universe, the fashion industry moved to Berlin and probably died off. And I, being interested in fashion and clothing, am selfishly glad that it is not this universe. Thank you, Lucien Lelong. There's also, I'm really interested in some of the stranger trends that grew out of this time, like the, the turban so big that you had to have a wooden infrastructure under it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's it's a lot to think about. Uh wearing on your head. And I really love the secret messages that are that were embedded in some of the fashions of the day and the way the Midinets were purposely making annoying clothes just to anger the Germans. April is so good at like doling out so many really inspiring and interesting tidbits. And now I totally want to embed secret messages in everything I make. So next, April is going to share details of fashion at the racetrack during the war. But first, we're going to have another brief break for a word from one of our sponsors. So this last segment is going to give you a really wonderful Easter egg uh, about the term clothes horse, as well as some pretty mind-blowing information about how salons, or one salon in particular, was using some very unusual power to dry ladies' hair. You also talk a little bit about how race courses uh, actually became sort of de facto runways during occupation. Will you expound on that a little bit? So um, the concept of the race track as runway isn't actually something that's unique to the period of the occupation. Um, attending the races was an immensely popular pastime for decades prior. Um, along with the theater, it was kind of the place to see and be seen. Um, so much so that fashion um, designers would send models or actresses to the races dressed in their latest collections as a form of advertisement. And this was really an established practice by the 1940s. So the association between women, clothes, and horses was so strong. This is actually where the term clothes horse comes from. Um, the models were there to work showing off the clothes just like the horses were there to work racing. Um, and during the teens, um, during the 19 teens, you also, in, in fashion periodicals, you sometimes also see professional models slangily referred to as jockeys for much the same reason. Uh -huh. uh, there was some, uh, some other really wonderful tidbits in your, uh, your notes. And one of them that just delighted me and sort of blew me away at the same time is this piece about cyclists, like bicyclists, being used to dry hair in the salon of the hairdresser Gervais. <laughs> Will you talk a little bit yeah. about how that worked? Right. So um, hand in hand with all this other rationing and shortages that, are, that was happening at the time, you can imagine it's wartime, right? So coal was also in short supply. And at certain points, electricity was being rationed. So you may have, you know, a few hours of electricity here or there. Um, but the hairstyles that were really fashionable at the time required frequent visits to the hairdresser to maintain that sort of quaffed, waved look. And usually that would be set under a hairdryer. So with all of a sudden spotty electricity, there was one particular hairdresser, Gervais. Um, he, he installed a tandem bike 
in the basement of his salon. And he hooked it up to this intricate contraption whereby he attached his hair dryers to stove pipes and those to fans. And then the fans were, t- were powered by teams of, of two people riding the bike in the basement. Um, and this is something that Lee Miller wrote about um, at the time. And, and she also ha- um, took photos documenting this. Um, and this was another reason that turbans were popular at the time. Um, so if your coif was less than ideal, if you hadn't been able to visit the hairdresser, you could cover it. Or alternately, you could use a turban to cover a wet set when you were leaving the salon. Aha! Uh-huh. Uh, I just love the idea of these poor people trapped in the basement bicycling so people can have beautiful hair. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um. She she writes that she writes that they would power produce enough power to dry around like a hum, a hundred women's heads a day. That's impressive. Uh, you talked a little bit about uh, wedge shoes still being a thing today, but was there were there any other long lasting echoes in fashion from this sort of stylish rebellion that was going on in France in World War II? I mean, I don't know so much about the stylish rebellion part, but. The 1940s are always a touchstone for fashion designers. So you always will see from time to time these references coming back to those really heavily padded, um, wide shoulders um, and the narrow nipped waist. Um, Readily, I can think of, I think Miu Miu did a really great collection in 2011 that was kind of loosely based on that silhouette. It was fantastic. Um, But, but yeah, it really, it's, it's where we are today with, with the very explicit connection between rationing and and fashion today would absolutely be with the shoes, the the platform or wedge shoes that we wear today. Uh, and I have to ask, if there were one style from this moment in time, from this sort of forced creativity that was going on that you could bring back today, what would you choose? You know, I don't know if it's so much about a specific style, um, that I would bring back and more about embracing a certain energy or mood. Um, and despite the fact that these were obviously very, very difficult times, I don't, I don't, you know, want to, um, gloss over that. These, these were, these were horrific times for a lot of people, but in these fashions, you can still feel this certain joie de vivre, right? Yeah. They were very spirited. They were very optimistic, um, and sometimes they were outright funny and laughable. So I guess what I would choose to take away from that is like really embracing this sense of playfulness in fashion. You know, have fun with fashion. Be bold. Don't be afraid to make a statement. These these ladies are making statements all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if you want to make a different statement the next day, that's okay. You have permission. Make an, and make yet another different statement. You know, the day after. You know, you kind of catch my drift. I think that. Um, if you're having fun with fashion, there aren't any mistakes, at least in my book. Oh, amen. I'm with you. Um, I, I'm still going to lobby, though, for the belts to come back. <laughs> <laughs> some belts embroidered well, with potatoes. Designer and... will, maybe some designer will hear this and, and a little spark will happen. We can only hope. I really love the idea of music, you know, laid out on your, your belt or any other accessory. It's so sweet. Um Again, I always feel so lucky when we get to talk to you because you have so much cool information about fashion and history. And uh, last time you were on, we talked a lot about your book, uh, Fashion and the Art of Pochoir, and also your book, Fashion Plates, 150 Years of Style, which continue to be spectacular. But there is a cool new development. Your Fashion Plates book is coming out in paperback this fall, yes? It is true. It is true. Um, It is actually already available for pre-order on Amazon. Um, so the previous edition was a luxury edition. For So for any of you listeners who may have been deterred by its hefty price point, um, there is now a um, much more attainable, accessible version available on Amazon for and, pre-order, and it will be out in a few months. And if the cover is the same one that's currently posted on Amazon, it's a very cool cover. Like you get some... It is. I actually just approved the back cover last week. Nice. So. Uh, and I, I will once again sing the praises of that book. I love it so much. It's just such a feast for the eyes and it's really the soul if you're into design at all, whether you're into clothing or any other kind of design. 
you see so much of like how human taste is developing through the years just by looking at the clothing. So it's absolutely beautiful and I can't recommend it enough. Uh, April, thank you so much for coming and talking to us about World War II fashion. How can people find you if they want to hear more from you online? Of course. Um, so you can follow um, FIT Special Collections on Instagram at, at FIT Special Collections. And you can also search online for our blog um, where we cover really fun, cool things that we have. Um, and you can just search FIT Material Mode Blog. The blog is called Material Mode. Cool. I'm actually going to post something fresh and new um, right after we get off the phone here. So. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, And we will also put a link to that blog in our show notes. Uh, April, again, thank you so much. You're just a delight. Thank Uh, you. It was a treat, like I said. Thank you so much for joining us for this Saturday Classic. Since this is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar during the course of the show, that may be obsolete now. So here is our current contact information. We are at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com, and then we're at Missed in History all over social media. That is our name on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Pinterest, and Instagram. Thanks again for listening. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 